Um, thank you for the presentation. Professor Park, I have a question. Um, the BL, the, the Bell and Road Initiative, mainly is to address the infrastructure gap. Um, but then in your slides in, in Indonesia, actually FDI is mostly geared towards iron and steel nickel productions. Uh, so I look at it this way, whether there will be two questions, because it actually does not address any overcapacity issue of steel in China. Secondly, is there a differentiation between this and capital flights that could happen that projects use this kind of BRI label and then do this kind of overseas projects? Well, the, the nickel uh, processing, mining and processing is linked to infrastructure. So it's being, uh, because obviously all of this new activity also needs, it's right by the water, so there's a port and then the, there's a power plant that's being developed to support the energy needs and uh, of the new park. Is it a so, Tangshan, the Tangshan project? The excuse Tangshan me? Is it Tangshan, 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 Tangshan Iron? I don't think so. It's a different. It's a different company. It's a stainless steel, so it's a more high-end steel. Uh, Angela may know more, but uh, so it's not completely divorced from um, uh, from infrastructure. At the same time, I, I appreciate your point, and even in the other context, there's a lot of these energy projects which aren't purely infrastructure projects, uh, although they often involve developing capacity of companies that, of course, are going to make a lot of profit from extracting energy and whatnot. We include that as a Belt and Road project. I think, uh, I think the Chinese government also views these as Belt and Road projects. Uh, in some sense, you can think of Belt and Road, I know there's a lot of emphasis on infrastructure, but of course the Belt and Road officially encompasses many dimensions of connectivity, including policy coordination, people to people exchanges, finance, uh, trade barriers, trade integration. Infrastructure is part of the connectivity, but I think China also sees uh, the Belt and Road Initiative even more broadly as a way to promote greater engagement of Chinese uh, firms uh, in neighboring countries. So uh, a lot of state enterprises in China are being strongly encouraged to pursue investment opportunities in other countries, even if they're not purely infrastructure related. And I think that's all considered part of uh, the engagement and part of the Belt and Road. Yeah. Yeah. Two inquiries to the same gentleman. Um, apologize, I came in late, so I didn't get your name. The gentleman from Pakistan, or yeah. thank you. Well, hopefully from Hong Kong, change cards later. <laughs> I'm Joel Lakin, Secretary General of the IPPF Energy Power Organization. Uh, we've been to Pakistan many times, also. There was a, there were two things. One, you mentioned six nuclear. Developments. I was aware of a 300 megawatt, very ancient uh, nuclear power plant built by the, the Chinese, I think, about 25 years ago. I didn't know there were five more. And then my second little point was, I may have missed it, that much was made about two years ago of a $55 billion development fund from China that's going to be given almost hand delivered or gift wrapped for uh, Islamabad to do what they want to do with. Is that, whatever happened to that? Yeah. Well, for the first question, um, so those nuclear, uh, that point that I was trying to make on that slide was that China has aided Pakistan in the development of its nuclear uh, capacity, not nuclear power plants, the nuclear bomb. So that was the first point, and it's not unrelated to BRI. Um, it, was, it was in the early 2000s. The second point about 55 billion, that represents the entire sum of projects, the, the worth of projects. It's gonna be over a se at least a seven year period, minimum, more likely 15 year period. And it's not gonna be on, on a plate. It's um, like I said, um, port development, building of rail, building of road, and also the building of um, electricity power plant. So it's it's a whole series of projects. And also that 55 billion sum includes the development of the special economic zones, which is why the time horizon spans to about 15 years. So 55 billion is the headline figure that uh, has captured the attention of the media and so forth. But it's across a number of areas and over a longer period of time.
Thanks, I'll go next. I'm Robert Ellender. Uh, no matter how I do want to ask whether the uh, canal across Thailand was going to impact the viability of any of those investments in Pakistan. I hadn't looked into that. Would you know, Angela? No, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I hadn't. Could because you elaborate? I, know, I, understand, yeah. I understand that its purpose is to uh, prevent the Malacca State Straits from being <laughs> such a squeeze point mm -hmm. for right. a similar reason as you right. described right. Pakistan. So I think that's, that addresses the security issue, but the, the length and the time that it takes uh, going through Pakistan versus going through even that canal around Thailand would still, th those benefits will still remain. Yeah. Yes, except if you're, tar if you're trying to ship to Shanghai, then yes, you still need absolutely. to. Right. Absolutely, right. yeah, yeah, agreed. I think there was a question back here. Well, uh, it seems to me that uh, one speaker had mentioned that uh, regarding the Chinese investment all along the Belt and Road region, it seems that many uh, local people are very cautious or maybe uh, they have some reservation regarding Chinese investment along this region. So uh, can uh, vice speakers to talk about the general attitudes or responses for those pe local people regarding Chinese investment in their regions? Uh, well, in uh, this is an issue not just in Belt and Road countries. It's a huge issue now in many countries, including Australia, where there's a lot of issues about uh, treatment of Chinese and even the United States in terms of being very suspicious of any Chinese company now doing business in the US. But uh, in Indonesia, I think um, it's a complicated uh, history, I think, of the Indonesian views of, of Chinese because it, it, it overlaps with internal ethnic relations between Muslims and Chinese with Indonesia and it's also related. I think people do appreciate uh, that at the government level, there's a very positive view, so it's being encouraged, and so people are keeping an open mind. I think we met people who, uh, the, the head of the uh, Chamber of Commerce in Indonesia, and uh, and asked him about these views, and they were they shared kind of the the suspicions of China, not so much, uh, not so much that they were trying to do something really underhanded, but that they didn't really understand how to work with Chinese or how to trust them or whether what their real agenda was and how they worked. And so they just felt it would take some time to overcome these things. And there was concerns that China was like sending its low quality people here and trying to take advantage, you know. Uh, those kind of exist. There was concern about them not wanting to hire local people, wanting to uh, just hire, bring more Chinese into work. I don't think all of those uh, suspicions were necessarily what China's actually trying to do. Uh, and they weren't saying they definitely felt that was happening, but there were it, it was an it was kind of a lack of uh, understanding and some skept skepticism uh, that will I think take some time to overcome. I don't know if you guys want to say anything. Yeah, I, I think that in uh, Russia and Central Asia, uh, it's uh, like more neutral or even positive um, um, attitude towards China. And I think that it's because uh, this region, uh, um, in general, uh, it, uh, it doesn't have any long history of relationship with uh, China, so it's all new. And uh, it hasn't been, uh, well, I mean, there, there hasn't been any uh, accidents like, or uh, disputes or uh, failed cases so far. I think that there could be some uh, uh, local tensions uh, in in some of the border countries, and we ha we know that uh, in some border regions in Russia, some people are concerned about possible like migration from China and as well as in Kyrgyzstan. But uh, uh, in, in in general, I, I would say it's uh, it's negligible. So in general, the overall sentiment so far is pretty positive, and. Uh, the, it's more about expectations rather than any facts uh, in, in hands. Right. Do you want to add? I think we don't. So, and, and actually, Alicia has a question, but she's also done some analysis of sentiment of towards Ch Chinese investment in different countries around the world. So she may actually want to. 
Well, I was going to ask a question, but you know. <laughs> But it's, it's very diverse across yes, countries. Yes, yes, but I can I can uh, maybe very very briefly talk about what we found using big data. It's a big data analysis with all of the basically millions of news all around the world, uh, looking at how countries, uh, well, how media in all of the world perceives the Belt and Road Initiative, and uh, in a nutshell, the the region where the and we can go country by country, but to make it very short, the region that looks more positive is actually Africa, believe it or not. And then followed by Asia, although there's some outliers, mainly India being very negative. Um, and, and then uh, the worst is Latin America. Uh, among countries, the worst of the worst is Poland, which is very interesting, actually. Uh, Bosnia. Uh, so there's a few like kind of very, very massive outliers. Uh, and, and not only are they negative, but they're, they seem to be well informed because there's a lot of news on Bad and Road. So some countries are hardly informed and they are maybe neutral, but these are kind of the, you know, the big themes in, to, to report here. But I wanted to ask a question on, uh, about Russia and China. So two, two quick questions. One is, and I remember Putin's uh, speech at the Belt and Road Summit in 2017, and I think to me he, he really made this very strong point that, you know, whatever is ex-Soviet Union, and he did mention European Economic, of course, uh, Union, uh, the uh, Eurasian, yes, yeah, sorry, I come from Europe, so, you know, this is a Freudian mistake. I meant to say Eurasian <laughs> Economic Union. Um, uh, he mentioned... For that part of the world, you come with me, basically. So I'd like to understand how China feels about Kazakhstan's uh, dry port. I mean, what, what, how does China feel? Is that the reason, by the way, why we have DP World and not Costco? Because to me, it's quite impressive, actually, that we don't have a Chinese uh, shipping company there, while every, everywhere, everywhere else, basically, you see all of these state-owned uh, companies. Pakistan is a good case in point running these projects or building these projects. How, how come Kazakhstan, um, Kazakhstan is different? Is it related to uh, kind of Russia uh, playing a balancing role there? Uh, I'd like to understand how Russia sees all of this. And in the very same way, how trapped, and I don't want to offend anybody, but how trapped is Russia trapped or not trapped? And what I mean to say is, say, uh, Hambatota in uh, Sri Lanka, yeah? Eventually, 99 years of lease, call it lease, yeah? So it's gone. I mean, the port is no longer uh, a Sri Lankan port, in my humble opinion. So what about the 400 billion in your gas pipeline? I mean, are you paying for your own project, or is it not going to be your project? I mean, how do you, yeah. OK. Oh, thank you. That's going to be a long answer. <laughs> Not too long. Not too long. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, yes, Russia is definitely a uh, major original uh, player, and it's been there forever. And uh, all these uh, Central Asian uh, 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 countries, they uh, used to be a part of the Soviet Union. So definitely the economic, cultural, political security ties are... Uh, uh, there with uh, uh, Russia. And uh, uh, definitely these countries, they are trying to benefit from uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. And also they are trying to benefit actually from anyone who could uh, help. That's why they work with Japanese, Koreans and everyone. And uh, the, they are very vulnerable in terms of the security perspective because ISIS is just next door to them and they have to be very careful what they do and who they uh, kind of build relationship with because uh, they used to have th certain threats and only because of the wise and pretty hard-handed uh, uh, leadership in the countries they they uh, like managed to sustain against the the, the, the this threat so um, Russia remains the major economic uh, partner and the major uh, security partner again but also the, one of the major uh, holders of debt uh, in, in, in the region. So, uh, but, uh, and uh, in, in many ways, uh, Russia is uh, definitely want to 
think about when you want to do something in the region. But I would, I would uh, mention one thing. In many ways, in Russia there are some people and in, in, in other parts of the world who say, look, this uh, Belt and Road uh, is something that uh, in the result of what Russia will eventually lose its influence. And my point here is that we have too much, as Russia, we have too much of this influence because sometimes we have to pay. Whatever happens is uh, in, in these regions, it's our headache. So that's why it, it, we are mostly interested in more balanced economic relationship of these countries with other parts of the world. So uh, yes, Putin probably made the point that you talked to me, but in, in other ways, it's uh, let, let's take our interest into account, but you better talk to them. So and all these countries, they're trying to make uh, they are, their relationship um, uh, in a bilateral uh, way. And Eurasian Economic Union doesn't play a big role so far. So most of the countries are dealing with China in, independently. And, uh, but probably it's like more of a soft coordination rather than some strict rules uh, and, and things like that. And I think that Kazakhstan is one of the best examples of uh, the way how the national strategy in this region could be uh, well implemented because they are trying to be more than just a transit country they, uh, or and more than just a sort of the resources to China. They are trying to build an international financial center, regional international financial center. They introduce a lot of uh, uh, reforms, actually. And, the, and uh, so uh, the, the GDP per capita in, in Kazakhstan is uh, higher than in Russia already. So And all the indicators show that this country is going to be growing um, in, in many years on. And, uh, just to mention one thing about um, Kazakhstan. Uh, it, uh, the leader there is pretty authoritarian gentleman. He's been there for 24, 27 years, actually, more than Putin. Nobody cares. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but, uh, and families around, clans, all this stuff, you know, you can imagine. It's like proper Central Asian state. But one thing he did very differently from, from others, from the, the very beginning of uh, the Kazakh independence, back 25 years, uh, uh, he started to send his uh, young generation to the best universities all over the world. Hundreds of young people uh, went to universities every year. So now they are all under the obli obligation to come back and work for the country. Now they are all back, and all the leadership in government, the middle level, Government, uh, state-owned corporations are uh, the, probably one of the best human capital in the world, and they they, they that's why they they easily introduce, for example, English law in that inter, uh, international finance uh, financial centers in Astana, for example. So we believe that this country is going to be. So Russia, yes, is important, but you still have a lot of uh, space how you can make your country really different in, in, in the region. And uh, regarding this trap, uh, again, it's um, uh, <laughs> Russia is in trap with it or without it. You know, the problem is that if you, if you, don't, uh, if you don't do this LNG sort of thing, uh, you, and you use pipelines, and it's, it's, as um, uh, your major income is because of your exports of uh, oil and gas. So you, you are trapped, basically. But uh, when you have only Western route, and with all these complications, you are really trapped. So no matter what the costs are of the pipeline to the east, it's strategically important. That's why, I was, uh, that's why my first point about all these initiatives is it's all about alternatives. And no matter how much you pay for the alternative, it's strategically important. The same thing with this uh, Horgos uh, dry port. It doesn't make economical sense because you don't really need to save time. Because if you send goods every day, you receive them every day on the, next, on the other end. You don't need to save 30 days because it actually doesn't matter. And it's definitely cheaper to ship the goods f uh, by sea. But uh, again, six, fifth, six, seventh fleet, you need an alternative. So it is an alternative. So no matter how much you pay. Uh, so I think we're at time.
And I just want to thank our speakers uh, for coming and giving uh, some very insightful comments on what's really happening with Belt and Road. So thank you very much. <laughs>